Good evening, and welcome to the November 6, 2017 meeting of the Merrimack School Board. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item number two is public participation. If you'd like to speak tonight, uh, please state your name and address for the record. And I don't see any students, but for the record, you just have to state your name, first name and grade. Seeing none, we will close public participation. Wait, we, if we have a, I saw a movement. No, okay, we're good. <laughs> That's fine. Those, those cushions can wiggle. Um, so we're on to item number three, which is administration's response to the maintenance items in the board's budget message. And I will turn it over to um, Tom Tussaud, Matt Chevenel, yeah. and we'll go from there. We have a um, water expert coming. Uh, the information was in your packet. Yes. And I think he was expecting to be here by around 7.30. Okay. So if you wanted to defer this and I'd be happy to do switch so. the agenda, that would be and I'm sure the board would be with fine us. with that. Okay, thank you. And so we'll get the... Uh, he just walked in. Oh, or that. <laughs> or now. <laughs> He, he stretched for you. So if you want to come right up. Yeah, come uh, right up. You're on. <laughs> you're on. So, so welcome. This, uh, this is Greg Sereni. Sereni? Sereni. I had it right the first time. Go, go with my Italian guide on that one. So a uh, certified water specialist um, and Tom Tussaud of our facilities department. So welcome, everyone. Just while uh, Greg gets his... Uh, uh, papers in order and whatnot. We've been dealing with Greg for a little over a year now to, you know, trying to look at solutions for the different schools and answering the questions that the board may have. Um, and now we're down to, you know, something that was in the budget message, so we thought it would be best to bring him to the table and to have him look at one possible solution and give you an example of what that would be for one particular school. So, Greg, you can go through all your, about your company, about you, um, the references, et cetera, you know, what you've worked in, in the past, and just, it stage is yours. Just hit the green button. Testing, testing, okay. Thank you, Matt. Um, so yeah, basically, uh, I was first talked to, to Tom about a year, year and a half ago when the issue first arose. It uh, came to be about the PFOA and PFOS in the water. We kind of did a quick um, analysis of what it would take to treat all of the water in one of the schools. And um, at that point, we didn't exactly as a company know what we know now. So just to give you a quick kind of introduction on who we are. Um, second win is we have two primary businesses. One is water filtration for both residential and commercial and small public water supplies. And the other is we operate um, a number of small public water supplies throughout the state. Um, we've been in business for about 27 years. We have a employee base of about 35 people. Um, got about 12 technicians on the road every day doing services and installations for water filtration as well as um, making rounds and operating these small public water supplies. So what I mean by that term public water supply is a, um, a facility that serves 25 or more people a day that's on a well. They're certified to um, have certain water quality standards and perform certain testing and maintain EPA compliance, much like what the city of Merrimack is required to do. Um, we have a wide array of treatment experience, including things like arsenic, um, uranium, radon, those naturally occurring contaminants that we find in New Hampshire, as well as the regular minerals that we deal with, like iron and manganese. Um, but we also have an extensive background in chemical treatment for things such as uh, MTBE, benzene, uh, those are gasoline contaminants, as well as 1,4-dioxane, 
which is a chemical contaminant. Um, we currently have probably about 175 to 200 systems out there for that type of thing. And um, yeah, I guess I should definitely mention that we work with a number of schools throughout the state, a lot of which are on wells. Um, for example, the Kearsarge School District, they have four, uh, three schools that we've worked with. Um, each school has its own well. We have different treatment at some of the schools, and we've been working with them for, God, probably about 20 years. I've been with Second Wind for 10 years. Um, my background's in environmental engineering, and I do a lot of things at Second Wind now, including sales, um, project management, troubleshooting, consulting. I am a salary employee. I don't get paid commission. Um, and we have a number of other operators who work with all of these schools. Um, the Barrington's another one to note. We've worked with them for probably 20 years. <clears throat> um, but a good story to tell you would be about the Hampstead Middle School. So they're a school that has about 500 or students and staff, give or take. They have a two-well system, and they found uh, PFO to be in one of the wells around 40 parts per trillion. Uh, the current advisory level is set at 70, so they're under that. Um, but I'm just sharing another story. They decided, they met as a board and decided that they wanted to treat the chemical. Um, and we installed a system. I'm not sure how many of you were able to have a few minutes to review the package that I submitted. Um, but there's some test results in there and some pictures just to kind of give you a, an idea of what something like that might look like. Um, this is about a 40 gallon per minute to 50 gallon per minute system, just to put it in, in terms of reference. Um, that might be comparable to what, what one of the elementary schools would require at your facility. Um, the high school would probably be a higher flow. And so as you can see, the, the equipment's substantial. It takes on quite a bit of room and, um, what Tom and I and Matt talked about as a different exercise is that the, I'm not a health expert, but the PFOA has been has been submitted as a uh, consumption hazard only, meaning it doesn't really penetrate your skin. It's not dangerous necessarily to shower or wash your hands in. And a lot of times in water treatment, that's the case, like with arsenic, for example. It's really only a consumption hazard. And in terms of sizing and costing out the treatment equipment sometimes oftentimes makes a lot more sense to treat only the water that will be consumed and this treatment system becomes much smaller much easier to maintain and so in the example for Reed's Ferry that we put together what we're recommending to do is to put in a central system that will treat all of the bubblers and a dedicated fixture to the kitchen um, the reason for that being is that uh, the main technology that we use for this chemical, which is uh, the best proven one at this time, is called granular activated carbon. And I have a little sample over here to pass on. Let me just zoom in off my to see what that might look like. Basically, we put this material in a large tank. As the water flows through it, the contaminants stick to it, and the water comes out clean. Now, on some frequency, that carbon will become full or saturated or spent and it has to be changed out. At that time, um, what we do is we, we take the material out of the vessel, dispose of it, put new material in, and then you're off and running. So with most facilities, especially a school for example, you know, 90% of the water you're using is for toilets, hand washing, cleaning, and it goes down the drain. Um, so in, in terms of ongoing maintenance and carbon change out frequency, by limiting how much water we put through the system, we'll be able to have a much more cost effective maintenance program. Does that make sense? Um, and I put a few costs in here. In terms of our system, we kind of have a good idea of what that would cost exactly. Um, the plumbing, you know, our guys are, are experts plumbers at installing filtration and doing the work we do. 
we're not necessarily the type of guy treatment or company that you would call to you know fix your sink or run a new pipe from here to there. Um, so what I would re recommend we do is pursue that option would be to do a walkthrough with one of my plumbers that I work with that work with a handful of them or someone that the facility that the district has a relationship with and get an exact cost and what it would be to tie in a centrally located system to each one of the bubblers and um, and cancel out the old feeds. So that's kind of my blast of information for you. Do people have questions? I'm sure there's can, you go ahead just please. One question. Can you explain a little bit about the lead lag, the two tank system? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so there's in terms of water treatment, um, there's a lot of ways that you can often, you know, treatment water treatment we often say is a bit of science and art. There's often more than one way to solve a problem. But with these types of chemicals, what we like to do is install what we call a two tank or redundant system where you have a primary and a secondary tank. So let's say for instance, um, if this were the case and the, and the water is flowing um, from this way, this way, and this is your primary tank and this is your secondary tank, as the contaminants begin to penetrate the carbon and load up on the first tank, we'll just do some dots here to kind of illustrate that. <clears throat> Let's say you have 40 parts per trillion coming in. At some point, you will start to get what we call bleed through or detectable contaminants after the first tank. Let's say, you know, 10. Um, so then the question comes to be, all right, at this point, if you have, let's say, you just have a single tank system, okay, what do we do? Do we change out the carbon? You know, what's our threshold for performing maintenance? So what we normally do, and we do this very commonly with all the other chemicals we treat, including arsenic, is install a redundant system. So when you start getting bleed through on the first tank, it's okay because you still have this full secondary tank with full capacity remaining um, for your protection. As this breakthrough after the first tank rises and it's closer to the influent <coughs> level, indicating that tank is fully saturated, we then pull the media out of there, put new media in it. What was the first tank now becomes the secondary tank. What was the second tank becomes the first tank. So we call it a lead lag rotation um, or primary secondary rotation. And so by doing that kind of program, you're guaranteeing that the effluent of the system is always zero and um, it keeps maintenance costs very predictable. We install these systems with water meters, and so as we detect breakthrough in the oncoming months and years, we'll record the water usage. You know, let's say we start seeing breakthrough at 60,000 gallons. It gives us some predictability in the future as to when to budget and expect future maintenance. Is that is that good? Yeah, Do you think you. that explained it? Could I, could I highlight one more point that we talked about? Uh, currently, we don't have all the PFOA uh, testing back from all the schools, but we do have reads, and reads came in at 17 parts per trillion. Now, with a system like that, 17 parts per trillion going in, is it pretty much a safe bet that you would get zero contaminants coming out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, what I didn't mention is since Tom and I first spoke a year, year and a half ago, is we've now installed a lot of systems, both residentially and commercially, for these contaminants. And done a lot of testing on our own dime, actually, to kind of gather that data in terms of, because it was sort of an unknown to the water treatment industry, is how long, what's the best available technology to treat this chemical, and how long will it last? Um, and so what we know now is, based on that level, we would definitely expect zero after the system and probably expect carbon change out on the order of every two to five years, which I think is, is very reasonable. Our, our, our concern with treating all of the water in the school is we might, we might um, really 
have to change out the carbon too frequently that it might become a real big cost burden. Cinda? <clears throat> So from a cost standpoint, when you're looking at, let's say, you know, for example, a small school, what kind of range are we looking at? I know you would have to probably go through and do the full analysis, but I don't know whether we're talking, you know, thousands of dollars or, you know, sixty to a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. I wonder if there's some kind of a range that you might be able to provide just to give yeah. me. Oh, so okay. for the Reeds Ferry, based on um, oh, a walkthrough okay. I did with Tom and approximately sixteen. Oh, okay. 16 drinking water locations we'd probably be talking about you know with plumbing included you know 13,000 to 18,000 and change um, so that would be the case for Reed's Ferry Thornton's Ferry has the same footprint same fixture count so it'd probably be a similar cost for them um, and the same thing with the with the upper elementary school as well as, yeah, so then, so with the James Master Cola Elementary School, they have about 30 bubblers, which isn't to say that the cost, so that's about twice as many as Reed's Ferry, which isn't to say the cost will be double, um, but it might grow a little bit from there. And then the high school, which I didn't do a walkthrough with, um, we'd probably need a, one system for each floor would be my guess, similar to Reed's Ferry. Does that make sense? Yes, so all in, we're looking at what's the total, maybe without without the high school? 100,000, that's what I was thinking. That's what it sounded like to me, yeah, okay. Michael, is your hand up? Okay. First, I'd like to uh, thank either Matt or whoever took the initiative to actually uh, go ahead and look at this um, definitely appreciate it. I think it's much more um, doable than the, I think, the million dollar quote that we got originally for putting in a full school uh, fil filtration system. Um, I'd actually definitely be interested in actually getting more concrete numbers. Um, obviously, that would be up to the board with the request there. Uh, and then possibly looking at whether the board is looking at what levels we want or if we would like to actually maybe even move forward and make this something to propose to the taxpayers to let them decide uh, next spring. So I think this is quite quite more feasible financially um, and uh, I think it would be good. I do have one question um, on I think on the third page of the document that you provided. You did talk about some of the contaminants such as MTBE, benzene, TCE, PCE. Do you have a list of what um, chemicals would actually be treated with the system that we'd be looking at? Is it, you talked about arsenic and stuff too, but I'm, I'm just wondering if there's a, a listing of certain thing, chemicals can that we provide could provide. That. that would be great. Please. I could certainly provide that. Yeah, one thing I didn't mention is um, activated carbon is most commonly used for chlorine removal and disinfection byproducts. So it will do that. Um, you know, a, a lot of the bottle filling stations that they install and sell now have little carbon cartridges, kind of like in your fridge, inside of the station, the bubbler. Um, what we found, and I should have shared this earlier, is that that small amount of carbon doesn't last very long in terms of gallons and throughput. We did a few tests at a daycare out at Pease when this issue came to be at Pease. I'm not sure how many of you have looked into that and read about that um, back in like 2014. And there was a daycare that had a carbon cartridge on every one of their bubblers. And the Air Force came through and did pre and post sampling, you know, before and after these, and they found the levels were the same. So here was kind of a, a little bit of a sense of false protection in that they thought they had filters, but it wasn't really achieving the, the removal they were hoping for. Are you that? Yeah. Um, I would just like to probably towards the end decide what we'd like to move do sure. as moving forward. Andy, you have a question? So yeah, I guess I have one question. So Tom and Matt, as you look at the buildings, seeing the, the pictures here of the two large vessels that would be in the room in the plumbing, do we have any space issues with being in any of the buildings where 
we think that these might not be feasible. I know when we talked about the full systems at, what, a year ago or whenever it was, we talked about having to add on or do something. These appear to be more in a room sort of thing. Do we see that, think that these would fit in all the buildings? We would probably look to the principals to be flexible as far as understanding that we need space and for a good reason. I think we can fit the systems in the schools that we have without any additional building. And one, one other question. Some of the, if we do decide to, to get a more thorough estimate, it'd be interesting to know for each school. I know that some of them have more cafeteria, you know, so, you know like the upper elementary school, places that do more food preparation. So understanding what it would be to, to make sure we cover all the consumption areas, because I know at, at Reed's and Thornton's it's a little less. They're not, it's not prepared there the same way it is at those. So I think it would be good to have a thorough estimate of all the consumption in all the buildings to make sure we're covering it so we're adequately doing it in all the different places. I think one other issue <clears throat> that we have discussed is why, why we're looking more at a central system instead of separate systems going all over the place when, on each line. Every time we t do a test <clears throat> for PFOAs, it's basically somewhere between two to three hundred dollars a test. So if we had 20 different stations in one school, that would be a recurring cost that would be very expensive. Unlike if we have one system where we take the before, after, <clears throat> it's a lot less testing for us and a lot less legacy spending. Okay. Michael, are we done? I'm sorry. Andy, are you done? Okay, Michael. Uh, just for clarification, I, I believe that you stated in the uh, for the kitchen there would be one sink that would actually have the water. Is that how you've done it in other schools? It's it's really up to you guys what you would what you would like. Um, I just I guess I use that as an example, um, but yeah, for most cafeterias we've found it's not too much of a interruption to their current process to use water for consumption from a single source. Um, you know, cleaning is one thing you know, that's different um, versus if you're making a sauce or a soup or a drink. But yeah, we could certainly plumb it to multiple fixtures in the kitchen. It's not a big deal. And actually to that end, I think a lot of, and I've volunteered in the high school cafeteria for robotics <clears throat> events, as you remember, uh, Chris, but um, they have the main sink for food prep and then there's a hand sink that's specifically hand washing to the side. So literally it would not be for consumption. So I think that I'm assuming most of our uh, cafeterias have the same way where they don't have large multiple large basins, they have one large basin and one hand washing mm -hmm. station, maybe? I believe you're right. Uh, one thing we'd want to do is get uh, Dave Zeke in here, make sure that mm -hmm. we covered all our bases with Dave. Also at the high school, there's probably two other areas, one that we were there earlier. Yeah, because I was going to say that, <clears throat> yep. And one across the hall, and we'll make sure that they have the water if that's the decision that's made. Okay. Um, the question I had was, um, you mentioned for the high school, and you don't have to know this. I'm, I'm putting Tom on the spot, so you're fine. Um, we have it says one per floor, um, but the third floor is, you know, kind of a limited space in the building. So, are you looking at the second floor being kind of the second slash third floor for the second system? Correct. Yes. And then the fourth floor where the pool is, right? <laughs> Freshman joke. There we go. <laughs> um, so actually, yeah, those were those were my questions. So um, you're looking at. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Andy. So when there's been a lot of discussion in town about PFOAs and different filtering, and there's a contingent in town that talks about reverse osmosis as being the better way to go long term because it attracts, it covers PFOAs, but maybe even broader. What's sort of the cost differential between a granulated charcoal, the way you're talking, versus something more advanced? That's a good question. Um, so we've installed systems but we've installed both systems for this contaminant as well as others. Um, the ideal, like in a residential application, you know, if any of you, do any of you have a reverse osmosis system in your house or have you ever seen one? <coughs> no. They're fairly small and a lot of them will fit under the kitchen sink with a little gooseneck faucet to the side and that's what you use for your drinking coffee, tea, consumable water. And it has a couple filters that you change and you change the RO membrane itself every so often. Um, when you're talking about a central system like this that will treat multiple fixtures, you're talking about a light commercial unit. And um, so what that requires is a, 
because the way that reverse osmosis technology works is it makes water very slowly into a storage tank. And then you have to repressurize that with a pump to all of the water using fixtures. Um, so in terms of your question, for a, you know, these systems were sized for roughly, um, you know, 10 to 12 gallons per minute of granule activated carbon, two tanks in series. If we were to do an equivalent system with reverse osmosis, um, I'd expect the cost to be probably close to double. Um, and the maintenance cost will be more. I'm not saying that's not a good way to go or to try, um, but it does kind of complicate things a little bit. These these systems that we use with grain activated carbon have no moving parts, no electrical requirement. Um, whereas reverse osmosis has a little bit more of a space requirement. You have the additional pump and level controls in the tank to worry about, as well as um, with reverse osmosis, for every gallon of water you make, you reject a gallon of water. And for the consumable water, that may not be significant, um, but it's certainly something to take into consideration. But I guess the question I would have as a, as a resident, right, is it's, so it's less expensive to do the activated granulated, granulated charcoal. Is the net effectiveness for PFOAs similar when you get done at the end of the day? Correct. Yes. Yes. Okay. The benefit of the reverse osmosis is it removes 99% of everything in the water, including you know calcium, sodium, whether it be arsenic, other minerals. So it leaves you with a very high quality drinking water like you might find in a bottle of water. Um, so it has that benefit. And it certainly is effective at removing PFOA. What a lot of the systems do that that, that are installed for, with reverse osmosis for PFOA is they also include a carbon filter as well. So it's kind of like a two-stage system. So you're really getting a, a bit of redundancy in that regard. Okay. Does that make sense? We have done a lot of light commercial ROs. We do them for coffee shops, um, small breweries. We, we put in a small or reverse osmosis system at the Ware Middle School. Uh, one of their wells has high fluoride. And they built the school in 2006, and the engineer was very intelligent. They ran a dual plumbing system when the school was built. So they have 36 bubblers that are all fed by this reverse osmosis system. The rest of the school is all um, you know, labeled do not drink. And so their, their treatment system is much smaller, but there was a lot of forethought mm -hmm. with that. It's certainly something I could cost out if you'd like. Um, I'm waiting for your hand to go up because I'm looking at you in the eye. So go ahead, Michael. <laughs> does, uh, before I do this, does anybody have any questions? Just one. Did you actually, um, do you serve any school districts that are on um, public water or are we kind of the exception there? Um, not necessarily. The answer to your question is uh, you're the first one that's been on city water that I've looked at besides two daycares that are located on the Pease Trade Port. Okay. So a little different. Um, but I've also talked, the Wyndham School District is going through a very similar situation right now. So their central school well, their, their schools are served by wells, and their central school well has PFO of around 30, 20 to 30. So they're below the 70, and their board is completely split. They've been going back and forth for over a year now. Um, the dialogue's been going on for a long time. I've been to several board meetings, done a lot of different emails, reports. Um, half of their board is saying, look, the water meets EPA standards. We don't need to do anything. Half of their board is saying we absolutely have to do something. Um, and so they're really struggling with that. But I, I, would, I would consider them in a similar boat because Again, their central school well is below the 70. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of the same question remains. Um, Hampstead was in a similar situation. They were in the 40, 40-ish range, um, a little higher, but still below the 70. So the, question's, the question comes up. Okay. 
which I kind of I actually have just two questions for you guys if that's okay. Oh, we'll do our best. Sure. If that's fair. <laughs> One is, um, and Matt kind of shared with me a little bit, but I wanted to just hear it directly from you guys is, where did this come from? This, you know, idea of sh should we treat this chemical? Um, you want to take that one? Because you, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's only me, but uh, definitely, uh, I think that I've led most of the discussion in regards to wanting to treat the water. Um, a lot of the information that I've I've read, obviously, there's limited, um, but shows that there's um, possibilities of issues with children due to um, learning capabilities, uh, immune immune systems, stuff like that. So, I think it's something that's fairly new. Uh, I'm not a proponent of actually having um, <laughs> fake stuff in our water, uh, chemicals that have been made by man. Yeah. So I've, I've been a proponent to try to mitigate it as much as possible. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Andy? To I mean, to follow it on, this is not just limited to schools. This is the whole town. There's a lot right. of, there's, there's emphasis in the town about the PFOA levels, where they're at, what's acceptable. There's a couple of wells in Merrimack that have been shut off. Um, because of the higher levels, there's a lot of discussion at the town level as whether the, you know, St. Saint, Cobain Saint is going to be held responsible to filter some of our water. So there's a lot of noise around, and we're one entity inside, and what we're struggling with is do we wait for all that other stuff to shake out, or do we become more proactive and say we will treat our schools, um, you know, and, and I think what we're going to be talking about is do we want to propose something and maybe let the voters decide whether they want to do it or not? So understanding the cost, the effectiveness, all that data will help us in our decision and our discussions yeah. about what to do. Yeah, I think that does wrap it. I mean, we are, you know, in service of a, a number of students, obviously. It's over, you know, it's going to be, it's like 3,500. 3,800, I'm sorry. Um, and staff, and, you know, we are responsible for, for their wellness while they're in our in our care. So. You know, when they're coming to our school, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing our part to be cognizant. I mean, we did, we had no desire to become water um, connoisseurs and experts, and you know, we want we want to teach math. I mean, that's our thing. You know, yeah. this is this is a this is a sidebar. This is a distraction, but in the same token, we we don't want to have to manage it day to day. We want we want to know that the kids are coming in and they're getting the best resources we can provide them. You know, best environment we can provide them. And we do that all the time with air quality, soil quality, water quality, um, you know, lead testing. We were very proactive on that. Yeah. So, you know, all of it. So, you know, changed fixtures when we didn't like, you know, things and we were, we were on top of it. So that's the way we are about our facilities and, and our environments. We, we try to stay on top of it. And so, you know, it, next week, as you probably don't know, we're having a joint meeting with the town council and the MVD will be on the agenda to talk about what their long-term strategies are okay. to improve water quality. Um, and, you know, what's going on, what's new. Obviously, St. Cobain, which you've probably seen in the news yourself around here, um, has been, a, you know, a con you know what's happened with that has been a concern for the community. And, and we get feedback because parents trust us with their kids. They're sending their kids to us and they don't, you know, want us not knowing what's going on with the water. And, you know, we are trying to be fairly plugged in, but we'd rather just teach math and stuff. So that's 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 what we're doing our part to try and make that our, our focus again. So that's where you come in. Um, that's where yeah. keeping those options and the, that knowledge comes in and testing comes in. And we don't want to test all the time either. We want to, again, spend our money on books and, and fixing the bindings on books that gets cut, you know, in our budget season. But... We're also not going to take turn a blind eye to what might be running through our pipes, so we yeah. want to get back on the ball. And and so water is a distraction for us. We'd rather just focus on education and hopefully, with the right solutions, we can do that again. Great. So, that's a great answer. Yeah. <laughs> I that kind of answers my second question, which was going to be, do you want? Are you looking to ensure that the water has no? PFC chemicals in it, or are you looking to ensure that the water is safe to drink? And it sounds like you guys have already been looking at those other things. And I would, I would say the answer is, you know, obviously it's kind both. of a loaded question. It's, it's totally <laughs> it's a loaded question. Um, you know, the biggest thing that we've, I think, figured out along the way is that there are chemicals we never heard of, never wanted to hear of, don't would prefer we never heard of before. But you know, we don't think that 
it's always going to be the end of the story. So, you know, the more PFOA came out of nowhere, and it's become a, almost a daily conversation in this community. Yeah. Um, you know, what's next? Yeah. So that that's something we think about, you know, long term as well. And that's what they talked about when uh, they came to us. It was the uh, Department of Health and I think it was the um, it was the, e the New Hampshire EPA type environmental service. So, so when they came in, they're like, yeah, they're, they're even talking about future chemicals to, to think about. So yeah. not what well, we Well, that's what's do. interesting is this was that in the water industry, there are a number of chemicals which are currently unregulated mm -hmm. and they may fall on into regulation sometime in the future. What the EPA does first is they sample for them throughout the country to determine how prevalent they are. And if they're, they find that there's pretty widespread, then they start to determine what the health effects are. And then they start to determine, should we put a, an actual enforceable limit on this? So that's kind of where the PFC thing was. So PFC was first discovered through this unregulated monitoring program, found it was pretty widespread. They dug into the health effects, found there was a few. Um, so it's kind of in that gray area now where it's not enforceable, but it's on the list of potentials to be enforced. As you all know, with the current cabinet, I don't, I don't envision any new EPA regulations rolling out anytime in the near future. <laughs> so, I guess I'll leave it at that. You tell me how far you want to go, and uh, I'm your resource to do what you need. Yep. Yep, Michael. So I just want to follow up on your question of safe. So, I view safe as a moving target. Um, safe by the EPA standards is always shifting. Uh, I think fluoride can be used as a primary example as that is that they actually set a standard and then changed it because it wasn't safe where it was at. And that's where I see that this might land is that sure. they have set a standard, it's gonna keep on going down. States have set it at 12, 20, 40, governments right, like at 70 lot, from 400. Yeah. So if we could get it to undetectable, then that's what I think is personally safe, not the board myself. That's kind of safe to me is not a word that I would use. It would be more of a regulated versus what do you want in your water. Yeah. And that's, that's where we're valid. interested in what your filtration systems actually do filter because it may not be regulated, but it may be filtered. So sure. that, that, that's a, you know, I, I'm definitely curious about what, what the list is for that reason alone. Naomi? This in some ways is a bit of a repeat, but I think um, when it comes to filtering water, from my perspective, uh, you're always playing catch up if you don't have a system in place, as in you discover there's something wrong and then try to fix it. So I think that part of the goal here is to look at whether it is feasible and um, a good idea for us to be ahead of the game in that way, so that we know the water is safe and then we can pay attention to what's happening in the region and see if our system would need tweaking based on new information. But I think that it, it just may have reached the point where uh, things come out regularly. We hear things about the water and by the time you hear it, it's been happening for a while. So it would be nice to be ahead on that. Well, that's actually, that's a good point. Um, the reverse osmosis unit that I talked about that we sell for residential applications our flagship unit. One of the selling features is that we actually tell people this will remove unknown contaminants, which kind of sounds like you know you're getting fed a, a sales pitch, right? But in truth, when this contaminant came to be, we had a lot of these systems already in Merrimack on private wells as well as the city system. Um, and these homeowners call us and said, "Is this removing this chemical?" And we didn't know the answer. And we went out and we did a bunch of tests and found out that it was. And so that was actually kind of a nice um, thing to really build our reputation for what we've been saying to people all along. Um. I had spent 10 years working in an environmental claim shop in latent claims, so it's been a while. But I mean, really, that's the truth of the matter is you don't know until you know. So I think it's easy to say with the PFOAs, how come we don't know? How come the EPA is changing um, the safe levels? It's because data, data over time starts to show you more and more information. And the same thing, I think what you're saying about unknown contaminants, you have effective way to remove contaminants, but some of those are just unknown because we were never 
able to test for them. So there's always these emerging environmental issues that are always going to come on the horizon. And as time goes on, you learn more through data, through research, through, yeah. like you said, pockets where you start to see exposure to some of these things. Um, I'm certainly not an environmental claims expert, <laughs> yeah. but I worked in operations and a lot of these notices of loss would come in and, and that's really what my experience has shown me is that you just don't know until you know and then yeah. you start to get more information. You're absolutely right. What's really unfortunate is um, when the whole peace thing came to be, uh, Department of Human Health and Human Services went out and did free blood testing for a lot of the kids at those two daycares that I mentioned. And uh, you can go online and look at all the data yourself, but their levels were above the national standard by a measurable, you know, the bar graphs were pretty clear. Do you write? Uh, uh, Michael? Um, I'd like to make a motion. No. I move to request the administration to receive formal quotes, review locations, and review kitchen needs for all schools in the district. Is there a second? Seconded by Cinda and Naomi, so I'll just, um, is there a discussion to your motion? Uh, I think that we've discussed it thoroughly. Um, what I would like to do is obviously receive this information, and then I think a couple good steps would be actually presenting it to the MVD, having them come, and then discussing it further also as a board once we got the information. Okay. Andy? I want to make sure that we get this in time for budget discussions because mm -hmm. if we as a board decide we want to put this as a warrant article and let the voters decide, for example, I want us to have the data in time and go through our deliberations so that we have the flexibility to do that. Yeah. So, okay. Cinda? I agree with both gentlemen. Okay. Um, the other thing is we maybe we want to have discussions, you know, regarding some cost sharing on it too. Maybe Merrimack Village District, maybe as a board we want to approach them um, for part of the cost or maybe even as a stakeholder in the community to St. Gobain. Um, but we need that. <laughs> um, if you don't ask, you can't get the yes or yeah. But yeah. I'm not saying, saying I'm really hopeful about that. You can't but, blame them for saying um, no if you didn't ask. But regardless, you don't know until you get the the quote and the cost for what that would be. Fair enough. And I actually still did have a question, so that's why I said no to you. <laughs> no, I wasn't being funny. I actually had a question. When you do put in these uh, systems in these schools, knowing that we have kind of a limited uh, window to um, to do infrastructure, Tom's peak season, when we're all enjoying ourselves in the summer, yeah. he's not. Yeah. So um, knowing we have six buildings, if we did um, make those moves, um, What's your capacity to be able to do that kind of um, scaled work for, we're kind of all over the town, yeah. so. In terms of the, our part of the treatment system installation, those are all one day jobs, maybe one and a half day jobs. Um, in terms of the plumbing, I would estimate that would, you know, making the runs to the bubblers down the hallways and all that. I'd estimate that in the probably, you know, per school, probably talking one to three days oh. in a worst case scenario um, you know what a lot of and I can only speak to my experience what a lot of places will do is you know start with one and sort of feel it out before they pop and go and do all the others um, but again that's totally up to you guys that this is the type of thing that we could bang out easily in a month in the summer um, if need be or maybe stagger them over through a couple school vacations, weeks, um, however you want to do it. Okay. I just didn't know what kind of infrastructure that you're talking about, especially as you're doing the runs to them. So for that was, you know, I, I didn't even know what expectations to set, especially as we're preparing for budgets, if what we're asking is unreasonable for you to even fulfill. So I can include more detailed information on that after we do the walkthroughs sure. with the plumber. That's fine. Okay. Okay. So no, no, now your motion has more context for me, so I appreciate that. That's right. So thank you. I do try. Um, on that note, is there any uh, comment or question on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of Michael's <coughs> motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. And the motion carries 500. So get your walking shoes on. I think you're right. walking through a couple more buildings. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you all.
Greg, you can leave, but Tom has to stay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. Tom, <laughs> Tom didn't get all his homework presented yet, so. <laughs> Thanks again, Greg. Thanks a lot, Greg. Hey, my pleasure. Yeah. Starting off with hand dryers, I was asked by Matt to take a look at our uh, hand dryer situation and how we actually go evaluate how the hand dryers and which, which ones do we put in each school. I'm, right now our policy basically is what we do is we try to replace the hand dryers or the parts with whatever is in the school. So there's no real thought on our behalf besides trying to keep everything as uniform as possible. <coughs> there's a number of thoughts about what goes into a, a hand dryer. <clears throat> One would be the actual cost, how uniform it is across the district, meaning that we wouldn't want to mix and match them through schools because when we go to repair them, it obviously takes us a lot more time. Uh, drying time is important because if people, are, it's not, their hands aren't dried by the time they come out, they're not very happy. <clears throat> uh, another thing is we look for is the decibels, how loud it is, because hand dryers do have a uh, nature of being loud sometimes. There's a kind of a golden rule. The faster your hands dry, the more louder it is. So that, that's, that's out there, that's part of the, the pie. And of course, my end, the one thing I really look is how durable is it? How long will it last? How much time do we have to spend repairing it? <clears throat> so we will start off with my, my look into the hand dryers. And I found really like three tiers of hand dryers as far as time. Some the hand dryers will dry your hands in 8 to 15 seconds. Others will do 25 to 40 seconds. Some will go 45 to 60 seconds. <clears throat> There's really a big range. I did two experiments, uh, one at the high school, New Wing. I went in, washed my hands, put a little soap on it, dried my hands, put my stopwatch on, <clears throat> and it came out to be 40 seconds. While I'm moving my hands back and forth, it, sitting here, it doesn't seem like a long time, but when you're in there and you've already done whatever you had to do and you want to get back to your meeting, that is a long time. Also, I did the same thing, main hall bathroom at the high school. <clears throat> that was 34 seconds. So the, the, all the dryers that we have operate, I'm going to say, in that 25 to 40 second time limit. Um, we basically have three brands that we use. One of the brands, obviously, because when they did the middle school, the architect spec the brand. That's what all went in there. I can give you a brief rundown of how many dr hand dryers we do have in our system right now. We roughly have 47 hand dryers. <clears throat> 12 of them are at the high school. 20 are at the middle school. One is at Muse, and one is at Emmy. All the other bathrooms are done by hand, tile, hand towels, recyclable. Uh, where we want to go as far as range of money, uh, normally these, the faster dryers cost a little more. There, there is a range, it's all out there. It's, it's from $1,500 per dryer <clears throat> down to $300 per dryer. We basically, when we buy and replace a dryer, if we can't repair it, we'll pay roughly $400. Um, so it's really what you want to do in how we want to look at this. How fast do we want our hands to dry or <clears throat> how much noise do we want to make in the bathroom? So we're kind of at the beginning of stages of talking what's important to us. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the dryer waiting. <laughs> so where we want to go with <clears throat> how fast we want to dry our hands to um, is important. Also, durability, like I said, is very important to me. A lot of these hand dryers that you see at airports, you, you stick your hands through it. Unfortunately, I think they're a really great idea for places. School is a little different, because sometimes people are in there a little longer. I'm a little more worried about vandalism in schools that you want. 
So making sure a hand dryer is really durable is very important to me. Not to say that they don't hand, have hand dryers that dries your hands quickly, but they are a little bit louder. Um, let me see. Normally, <clears throat> I think our hand dryers, if we talk about sound, we're probably right around 70 decibels. <clears throat> Some of these hand dryers that you see are in an airport uh, could be 80, 90, 95. Um, so, as I said, the, the range of the price, so it's kind of getting a direction. How, where, where do we want to, or what do we really want to do with all in concern of everything that goes into it? Sound, cost, quickness of having your hands dried properly, very important. I'm going to jump back to one of the things I didn't mention to you, but I should. All our elementary schools of t paper towels, <clears throat> just because obviously in an elementary school, if you walk in, the last thing a, a teacher, <clears throat> I would think, or a principal might want is a lot of noise going on in there. They're trying to keep the noise level. They're trying to listen to see what's happening in there. If something goes by and they're standing outside the door, they want to respond to it. So that's why we're more paper, that's why we use paper towels more in the elementary schools and less in the upper grades. So I'm kind of looking for you, to you guys, for you, for a direction on where you'd like us to head, and is it going to be a all at once, or is it a partially phased in um, move? Okay, Michael. Well, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for all that information. So I'm the individual that actually asked about the uh, hand dryers, um, and I'll give you some background in my experience and and why I kind of asked for this. So I've gone to numerous events at the schools and go to dry my hands and I feel like I'm going to miss the actual event when I'm drying the hands. Um, also seeing that, you know, it's 34 to 40 seconds, there's only ha two hand dryers and how many kids are going through the bathrooms during break times and stuff like that. So if you look at that, the breaks are short, 30 to 40 seconds becomes an issue. What will usually happen is the kids will either A, not wash their hands, or B, probably leave with wet hands, which I'd rather wet hands than no, not washing them. So, you know, I, I definitely will say that someone will say that this probably isn't something the school board should address, but I also think that hygiene also leans to, you know, missed time in school and sickness throughout the school. So I think that it ties very well into the overall stuff. So this is great information. I, I didn't take into account decibels when I was thinking of it. Um, obviously, that would be probably something that I, I would say the administration would have to decide on really not the school board because that's something the day-to-day -day stuff and if if you were to put a hand dryer in the bathroom at 95 does that affect the overall close proximity to classes and stuff like that so I at first was thinking oh let's just replace them with high efficiency but obviously you brought some good information there that I think is is relevant that has probably a further discussion and I guess possibly even leave it to the administration to decide if they want to you know look at this further and see if there's a solution that can be done so that the kids do have better hygiene or have the ability to provide better hygiene. So I'm not sure if that's a good way to go or what, but I appreciate it. Mark? So I think tonight you'll see that of the three items that were named um, for number three, um, that is the maintenance items, the reason we're raising these up is because they all have financial implications. And as we try and put the budget together, these items were not named, for example, in the SIP, um, your capital improvement plan. So um, some decisions have to be made. And when we come back to you, we're going to talk to you about that because we're also um, held responsible for coming up with what I call a prudent budget as well. So it's trying to figure out which items are perhaps more important than other items. Water has been an item that you've been speaking about for a long time, but hand dryers really is not. It was something that Mike openly admits that he raised up, and it was picked up as part of the budget message. So in order for us to have uh, a sense of where to go, it was to find out if all of you feel similarly or not, um, if we could perhaps um, address it in another way because I would have to say um, anytime any of you raise up something it's important enough to be investigated for sure however 
I would have to say when we go out into the field and we, we meet with uh, the administrators, nothing had been raised up. Other things get raised up, but that particular item had not been. So it was, if anything, to um, raise up this item to just find out anyone else's experience, anything else you would offer up. And then Tom did due diligence. We learned more about hand dryers than any of us ever knew before. I would have to just tell you that. I mean, even gradations, what we see on the throughway <coughs> compared to what we have in schools. And I had even forgotten that we were still using recyclable paper at the elementary. But it makes sense because you have teachers, in many cases, accompanying their students to the bathroom areas. And they stand there. And so it's, it's very much purposeful. It's at the upper grades that we do something different. So um, if you tell us, go forward, then we need to put some cost to this because you have a sampler of what it is. But that item is going to come up against other items. So there's just going to have to be some help with figuring out what's more important than something else because what I will tell you looking at this budget right now um, some choices are going to have to be made um, because we're just like a family not going to be able to do everything so um, I know that again I brought this up so I would think that at this point it's probably not something that would be burned to probably put in this budget based off the additional information that Tom has provided but I think it's something to further the discussion and look at in the future and see if there's either a, a if we would want to move to something else and maybe put up a plan where it's slowly transitioned versus just a full thing or if we're good where we are so but I, I don't think that this should personally this is not a urgent matter um, or nor something that we should look over beyond if we were water is more important than something like this so uh, that that's how I would see it okay um, Cinda I agree. I don't think this is something that I would want to see addressed in this upcoming budget season. And if nothing else, we just got a lesson on decibels okay. and drying. So this is good. It's, it's like science. So The stopwatch was my favorite. It was, actually. <laughs> so, But we always have the kids come to us and talk about their scientific you know, studies, and you do it in your job. So I want the kids that are watching at home who aren't watching at home. Uh, but. Uh, their parents to let them know that you do scientific experiments even in your job when you grow up. Absolutely. So I'm just putting it out there. So I appreciate the detail. Thank you very there much. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. And I think number three is response to Honeywell. So I'm going to start and then I'm going to ask my colleagues to join in. So um, again, uh, we purposely brought Jim Lucy to the fore. Uh, for you to hear. Um, he has been working with us closely and as you know Honeywell <coughs> sponsored two of our teachers at a space academy so we just were interacting more than not and felt that it was a good time for us to take a look at the infrastructure in all the buildings and it yielded a tremendous amount of information and rather than hold it back we could have held it back after the budget season and brought him forward in the spring but we thought it was important because we just had this big conversation to put him before you when Jim left that particular night he and I talked the next day and I said the most significant thing for you to do right now in the school year 17-18 is to begin to draw up baseline data. Do you remember how you all talked about this is really great, we know we've got things to do, but it would be very good if you could do some air quality sampling, um, if you could just <coughs> gather some results over time to give us guidance. He heard you loud and clear. I asked him to begin to do it. What we are waiting on is to wait for the weather to get cooler. So we have closed spaces and that's when he's intending um, to have Honeywell uh, begin to um, gather some information. I'm talking January, February. So it was my intent to have the capital improvement plan for the next go as well as the next budget season to um, interplay both what he said from a Honeywell point of view up against all the items that we've got in the future and do, if you will, threading, I guess is a good way of putting it, as well as him collecting this baseline data that we could refer to into the future. He was very satisfied to do that. And again, you had wonderful dialogue and he heard you loud and clear, I think. So um, Matt and Tom, do you want to add to that? Okay, I'll uh, go for first and then Tom can wrap it up. <clears throat> 
But, uh, yeah, when talking with Jim and Lucy, you know uh, we, we've been involved with, with Honeywell, and Honeywell is our, our major um, uh, mechanical systems provider and software provider and everything like that for our, uh, all of our mechanical systems and HVAC systems. And, uh, you know, we, we entered into uh, a 12-year lease purchase with them almost 12 years ago um, to provide... Um, savings that would pay for itself and unit ventilators that would take care of rising co2 in classrooms that only have exhaust only and jim talked about that specifically where you have a lot of areas in the high school in reeds in uh, thornton's in the upper elementary school the only school you don't have the issue is in the middle school because it was built in 2004 uh, where there's exhaust only in the classrooms and when you get 30 kids or 25 kids in a classroom uh, the co2 level levels can rise that causes students that can have an impact on learning quite frankly it causes students to get a little drowsy and get a little inattentive perhaps get a headache or something like that which it can do we, everybody's been in a stuffy room and we call it a stuffy room but really it, what it is it's a room where the CO2 levels have risen and it's making us not feel as good as we really should or as not as sharp as we normally should be. So that's something we want to go through with Jim. Look at those areas that don't have um, unit ventilators in them. Uh, see what the levels are and see what a good plan of attack would be to try and get ventilations, ventilation into those areas that don't have it currently. So. That, that was my take out of it. That was the main idea. Tom? I think they, when they walked through and they saw our facility, obviously they've been with us for quite a while. They have looked at some units that last time they didn't look at because of their age now. We, one big thing that was out there was we call it the heat wheel. Well, it wasn't really the heat wheel. It was the ventilation for the uh, cafeteria at the high school. Uh, they're out there looking for any other idea, any other units that might have similar age to it, and basically making sure that we're going to be within compliance. We found out at the high school when we looked at that, besides needing to replace it because of its age, it wasn't in compliance. So this is all going to fold in and help us grow long term. And I'm looking forward to see what kind of data they will come back with. Thank you. And I have to say, the proposal also talked hit on some of the things in our CIP, like window replacement. So, it's not taking, an, it's not like adding another, but it's also replacing by by doing something a little more comprehensive. So, I think that makes complete sense, um, and it gives us time to do to collect that data. So, you know, thank Jim for his uh, presentation and continuing study, and we look forward to it. Was there any questions or concerns on Honeywell, um, Andy? So, if I remember correctly, a few days after the Honeywell presentation, there was an issue with at Reeds Ferry School with the I give I don't know, it was the boiler or the or the feeder or whatever. So I guess I I like the idea to look forward to to look at the overall plan you know for the next budget not this budget season but for the next one. But I think what I also as a board member would like to see is as you're going through the diligence, if there's any red flags that we need to address before this plan comes to play. You know, did, what, did the thing at Reeds Ferry, if we had to look closer, would we have noticed something ahead of time? Are there other things that maybe we could look at near term to say, we've, we noticed this and we can't really wait until you do the longer term proposal? So for me, that's what I'd be interested in see. So if there's any way as we're going through the budget cycle for you to identify something that is not on your radar screen today, but that you notice, it's sort of like going for an MRI and you mm -hmm. notice something you didn't expect, right? <clears throat> it's, it's sort of the same thing because I want to make sure that in the budget we have money spent for things to be proactive rather than reactive right so okay thank you thank you and now we're on to item number four which is the administration's response to board questions regarding full day kindergarten uh, so I invite to the table principal of Reeds Ferry Kim Yarlot principal of Thornton's Ferry Bridie Bellamere and Principal of Mastracola Elementary, Michelle Romaine. Yes. Any 
He pushes the chair in too. That's very gentlemanly. So, so welcome. Welcome. <laughs> oh, are you the little shrimp over there? We are doing a presentation on kindergarten. <laughs> Do you want me to lower mine, Brady? No, okay. <laughs> Is it going to come up yet? Um, so, thank you very much. It's taking us a little while to get organized here. Three Musketeers. Um, I'm Kimberly Yarlot, principal at Reed's Ferry School. I'm Michelle Romain, principal of Master Coa Elementary School. Bridie Bellamere, principal of Thornton's Ferry Elementary School. So we were last with you in, at the end of June when we um, had come to visit, visit you to talk about full day kindergarten. And at that point, we had done some visitations to other districts who had, full day, who had just recently implemented full day kindergarten had an opportunity to share with you some research and then had an opportunity to gather some of your questions off of that presentation. We've spent time um, reviewing your questions and we're at our second presentation um, here with some, some clarifications and um, we hope that in January we can bring teachers on board and they could further um, provide some um, information around our proposal or our interest in full day kindergarten. So I'm going to turn it over to Bridie while well, she just sort of, we, we were able to, um, as a team, work on a vision statement, which I believe you have in your packet, and like Bridie Bellamere to speak to that vision. Can we pull that slide up? So in determining the vision, especially for viewers that aren't present here, we really wanted to uh, get the message across that um, we were looking at short-term and long-term um, community benefits as well as um, personalized learning benefits for children in the community. So that's what our vision um, tries to en encapsulate. Um, so in the beginning, the first paragraph, we talk about focusing on the short-term or the uh, specified learning um, growth opportunities for young learners aspiring to integrate the um, lifelong skills through the implementation of both the academic and the social emotional programming. And the second paragraph really focuses on um, what do early literacy, full day programming, uh, what are those benefits long range that um, help to not only serve the community but the economy even. Um, and I appreciate that, Cinda, you integrated in the previous um, presentation the significance of data. And as more and more data emerges, um, around any specific topic, it helps to better inform us. And certainly, um, there's more and more data and evidence that shows the benefits of full day programming um, for early learners, which we've tried to um, just share briefly a, a few of the studies that focus on the long range societal economic effects, such as the enhanced social emotional development, improved overall health and wellness, reduced dropout rates, reduced reduced delinquency, increased reading proficiency, and overall increased academic achievement, just to um, mention a few. And these come from a variety of uh, data points, and certainly we'd be happy to share that data with the board um, at, at a later time. Um, but they range from um, the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning, otherwise known as CASEL, Journal of Applied Development, um, Psychologists, Educational Research Journals, um, there's journals in medicine, psychology, so it's really um, a cross point of, of data that can speak to the long range economic benefits of full day programming. So we thought that was really important for the viewers to understand um, as um, we evolve as a society, so has what we're providing in the way of learning experiences for our learners um, as early as the preschool and the kindergarten. Um, age groups. So that was our intention of trying to get that messaging across in our vision statement. So yes, and speaking of that, we you know we we're obviously um, passionate um, educators ourselves, and there's a lot of expertise you know in the field just among our staff members, our kindergarten teachers who would advocate for this. But there is also the substantial amount of research that supports it. So we were trying to really balance our own passion as um, to the research that's out there and provide um, a very um, balanced point of view about this. Um, so we've really broken down the benefits into the economic benefits and the benefits to the kindergarten learners. So clearly it goes without saying that full day kindergarten provides uh, students with more opportunity just for, for instructional time. You're going from a two and a half hour day to a full day. Um, it's an increased opportunities for the application of the skills that they're obtaining for the guided discovery for the actual um, practice and 
problem solving, um, working together in groups. Um, as Brady mentioned, the opportunity for personalized instruction, which is very challenging in a two and a half hour, um, hour time slot to even to get to that personalized instruction. Um, and the flu I'm sorry, the fluidity in programming from preschool to kindergarten. In some cases, we have students who are in our system who actually have more instructional time in preschool than what it's offered in our 2.5 hours in kindergarten due to um, individual education plans. So we've had to really retrofit their programming when they come to kindergarten, finding ways to offer extended days for them so they'd actually go from receiving more instructional time to us looking at our current programming and saying, well, how are we going to match that if it's coming um, off of an IEP? Um, and we have found ways and we have been successful, but that's for a small uh, population of, of students. So speaking of that is that um, it would um, provide fewer transitions when a child goes from a preschool program with more hours to a kindergarten program where we're retrofitting their programming. Um, there's a lot of transitions involved. We also currently in this day and age have kindergartners who some may arrive to us from um, a local daycare, get off the van or the bus and be in a morning kindergarten program, be picked up by a van and go back to that daycare until you know five or six at night and those are that's a lot of transitions for a young child so we feel that that alone is really speaks to one of the benefits for the learners um, increased opportunity for social emotional learning um, our kindergartners don't currently have access to the phys ed teachers and the art teacher the music teacher so the unified arts um, would be an access point for full day kindergarten students and then um, just the you know increase of um, learning activities. Um, we and again we cite this both from our experience and from research sites. The other thing that we were really looking at too is the benefits to the community. Um, we talked about uh, a little bit about the economic development, but there is truly an appeal to homeowners as they move to Merrimack. A question um, could easily be that you know do you have full day kindergarten? And are we losing potential um, buyers by not having full day kindergarten to maybe our um, sister communities such as Nashua or uh, Manchester? There's a lot out there that speaks to the productive citizenship um, and equal access to education for all families. Um, the alignment of current trends throughout the state and the country that um, where it's more often than not students are offered full day kindergarten reduced uh, high school dropout rates and increased enrollment in higher education. So by paying it forward, you are um, adding benefits to the community. So here's a comparison of a current half day program next to the full day program. And if you look at the time spent, so currently our students spend approximately 440 hours at, in our kindergarten program, and that does not include the transitions in and out of the classroom, snowsuits, um, the transitions within the classrooms, that's around the approximate amount of time they spend in school with us. A full day kindergartner would be provided with approximately 920 hours of instruction a year. So right now, when you think about the resources and the programming that we have, kindergarten through sixth grade, including our new math and visions program, the Lucy Calkins writing we've been to, here to speak to you about, we are modifying those each day. They are programs designed for full day kindergarten. So each day the teachers are making decisions about how much of the lesson to do within the day. Do they need to take it over two days? Will they stagger writing over a few days in order to fit all of the different components in while still meeting standards and curriculum that are designed for kindergartners? Um, Kim mentioned currently our students do not receive art, music, or PE regularly in kindergarten. Providing full day would, ac would give them access to that regularly. Um, again, a majority of the kindergarten day is focused on literacy and math and allowing more time within the full day program would allow more opportunities for integration, science, social studies, the arts, 
Um, we've talked a lot about STEAM and STEM activities, and it would they, they would have more time for authentic learning and application of skills rather than the majority focusing on literacy and math. Um, and the last comparison we have up there is the developmental level of a kindergartner, a five-year-old, and the amount of time that they need to develop gross motor, fine motor, to play and explore the curriculum areas. They would have more opportunities for those things as well as access to resources and supports within our buildings that we have and they would have more access to with more time during their day. We've mentioned certainly the benefits of social emotional learning um, throughout the year as members of the Me mental health committee have come to present before the board and to the community and you know that would certainly uh, continue to benefit students in full day programming um, and again we just cite the research that you know supports how teaching these explicit skills um, and competencies uh, result in long-term benefits for these children as they become adolescents and adults contributing to society as evidenced um, just by one piece of research here which um, states that uh, children with stronger social emotional competencies are also more likely to graduate from college succeed in their careers have positive work and family relationships better mental and physical health and to possess the body of skills that the current labor market demands um, again just trying to tie the social emotional competencies back into our vision. So this is a map published from uh, the New Hampshire Department of Ed. It looks at this was done in 15, 16, and there's this is the most current map that they have. You'll notice that the towns in orange are the towns in New Hampshire that are providing full day kindergarten. The towns in blue are towns that full day is partially implemented, meaning that it may not be, there may not be a full day program available in every school. Uh, it, this, all, this map also does not differentiate between towns that have programs that are publicly funded or parent funded as well. Um, however, you can look at the number of, of districts in the state that currently are offering full day kindergarten in New Hampshire. So this is just following up on the map we talked about. Approximately there are 104 New Hampshire districts. Um, some of the districts that have recently added kindergarten within the last few years, Bow, Amherst, Nashville, and Hollis. It's also worth noting that Manchester has a full day program. So the cities sitting around us are offering full day program. And at this point, around 78% of students across the country have access to a full day program. So clearly um, something that needs to be spoken to is the implications to the budget. Um, at the lower elementary school, we view the adoption or, and implementation of full day kindergarten as our greatest priority. Um, the largest fiscal impacts will come from increased staffing and uh, original equipping. We're projecting adding a total of seven classes, two at Master Cole Elementary School, two at Reeds Ferry School, and three at Thornton's Ferry School, totaling seven classrooms, with a projected overall enrollment of 240 students. To help address some of the conversations that we've already had and the questions that were raised, we have formed a kindergarten task force with the members listed above. There are uh, the three of us as administrators. We are also have um, school board member Schoenfeld on our task force as well as a kindergarten educator from each of the buildings, um, Christine Thibault, Barb Burns, and Kim Bolduck. And then we have um, two parents currently, Ingrid French and Brian Steiser, and we have actually have another parent, um, Brittany Gagnon, that will be joining us. And so the task force will work throughout the year. We mentioned that when we came in June that we know that ha simply having more time is not the only answer for kindergarten and that we need to continue to refine all of the things that we do anyway in kindergarten so this group will help be part of that process as well they we will be back in January and at that point we are looking forward to the educators 
speaking with all of you. So going forward, we'll continue to look at uh, fiscal impacts. Um, we have a core team looking at sample schedules. Um, and we'll be looking at curriculum and instruction and looking at uh, population trends. Those are some of the charges that the task members have been given. Um, and we're, we feel that we're on a really good role towards um, investigating all of these known and unknown impacts. And we really hope that um, we've answered and addressed your questions from our prior presentation in June and seek out any clarifying questions, comments, um, next steps and so I turn it over to you thank you are there any questions from the board Cinda questions or comments I should say um, as it relates to the unified arts um, in the schools right now do we know if we have the capacity to su support that with our existing staff So with the larger elementary schools, it would be tighter. However, we have had um, a lot more students in the past and have managed really tight schedules. So in um, conferring with the specialists, meaning the unified arts teachers, we have found that there are ways that we can um, address that. Um, and, the, and again, in some of the models we've looked at, they've broken it into like 20 minute and 20 minute incremals, increments instead of 40 minute block or 45 minute block of a um, unified art session. So there's ways that it can be addressed creatively within a uh, schedule. So the answer is yes. Okay. Um, and I have one request, which is to, if we could put this informational packet out on our website, um, just so it's available um, for the community. Definitely. And I was just gonna add one fact that um, Matt and I, a few weeks ago, were at a seminar for NHSBA for budgeting, and sitting next to us was Milford, and they're also in the middle of investigating a rollout of full day kindergarten and that's right next door to us as well so just a little fact to throw in that they're in the throes of it as well Andy did you have your hand up yeah just just really quick I, this is really good a good a good summary a good analysis some of the maps that you've included about where the kindergarten classes would go in the schools is helpful one of the things that I think that I don't know if you've talked about this or not but I'm sort of looking down at Matt is that when you have full day kindergarten it's going to affect the transportation a bit I believe because Right now you have half days with bus transportation, I guess. Or are we planning on bus, bus transportation for the students on full day kindergarten, you know, so you'll have more kids that ride the bus both ways, potentially. I don't know, Matt, is that something that, that you've considered or? Yeah, we, we've considered and we looked at our current capacity and loads and whatnot. And seeing they're all, you know, usually if there's a kindergartner, there's an older brother or sister, and they're going to the same spots. I don't see a diversity of stops and the, the new people that may be coming aboard. So I think we can pretty much, unless I find out otherwise in the near, you know, pretty soon, that we could handle the load without any increase in transportation. Marge? So the other thing that's important to know, if, if we were doing half-day kindergarten, it's 185 students vis-a-vis -vis 240 for full-time. So that 55 additional students is really spread across the district. So we just don't see it being an issue. Well, the, the only reason I ask is because half-day, mm -hmm. the students are typically riding the bus just half of it. Correct. For whole day, now you've got them it's the same mm -hmm. schedule as a first grader or second grader or something like that. So it's a more formalized you know process is now part of the normal rigor so Michael thank you for the presentation um, I want to follow up on something that I asked for back in June and wanted to see if this was going to be forthcoming as you gather more information but I asked for um, maybe a portal or something like that that you could actually share documentation to help educate uh, myself or other board members based off the information that you gathered some of um, the information here like such as um, the economic development benefits, the productive citizenship, like where you're pulling that information out of so that um, I, we can read, read those articles to actually uh, better educate ourselves as we're making this big decision, I would say. Um, I also had a thing where you talked about fewer daily transitions for the students, but my question would be is that school goes to 2 to 30 and parents were sending them to daycare till 5 or 6, wouldn't there still be the same amount of transitions possibly for these children that they'd actually be going for <laughs> I can totally answer that because I was that parent so we the kids would take the bus um, well the kids would take the bus from daycare because they did the afternoon 
to school, took the same bus back to daycare. So they had morning session at daycare, midday transportation, afternoon classes, afternoon transportation, and then pick up from the parents. So you're so talking, drop talking, off and pick so, up. So the afternoon kids may have less transitions, but the morning kids could still have the same amount of transitions. Is that well, they would have they would take the bus in the morning, get, um, and then at twelve o'clock they get their daycare pickup. And then the afternoon, um, they would just have yeah, the parent pick up. Right. So at 2 o'clock, they'd go to daycare instead of 2. Or a supplemental right. program. So, they, they'd right. be yeah. still. So yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to. I was, it's going to depend because, I mean, I remember back in the day um, that a lot of times parents have to drop out their students before the normal start of what a school day would be. So they have to go to a day, daycare center. And then there's transportation mm -hmm. of the daycare center to the school. And then if at the end of the day, if the after school program that Thornton's or, you know, Reed's has doesn't go long enough, they usually would have a van going from the at the end of the school to the daycare center, which might go longer. So there, there could be transitions at the same level, but I think it provides more of an opportunity for the bulk of the students not to have as many transitions because it's a full day program, mm -hmm. which would hit a broader number of students than there are today. So. Yeah, I, I just wanted as we were going to the public, I want it to be clear because some of them might be like, well, no, it's not. So I'm trying to bring that forward to be able to define it so that as we're presenting it to the taxpayers, it is well defined so there's less holes to, for them to okay. poke into. <laughs> I have Marge and Naomi. Uh, Mike, I just okay, want to raise. I just want to raise up. Uh, you talked about having access electronically, and the um, team was here on June 19th. And the day after, we put up the article. So I just had Matt go to make sure it was there because. Okay, I guess I had asked it to be shared with the board, and I don't re recall actually getting. Okay, and, and, I, it, and it's not just the article; it's actually the articles that they're receiving their information and getting. On on the left hand side of the web page, there's an apple with a pencil. It says "Full Day Kindergarten," and I believe that's what was requested to. No, no, the request was for better documentation to educate myself and possibly the board members on where you're receiving the information regarding Completely the benefits misunderstood. of yep. then that was misunderstood by me because we immediately <laughs> put everything uh, that had been researched up online yeah this was a research based studies so, on full day kindergarten oh so, so it's the studies actually yes, yes. Oh, okay sorry yes. I, I had just asked for it for us but okay no it's I it's wasn't been aware out that there. it was actually put on the website yeah and all these yeah. are yeah. you know we asked for everything for the website so i they, we okay. that's a I'd, knee jerk which is awesome it's actually it's an upgrade yeah. so. no i just i guess good stuff yeah i absolutely. appreciate going up i just was hoping it would have i okay. didn't <laughs> expect it there i expected it actually in an email or something so okay i will Sorry. look at the website now though yeah <laughs> no, it's it's in there as you see with prego um do you have your hand up chris yeah. Will half day kindergarten also be uh, offered alongside this, or is it just going to be 100% full day? That's an excellent question, and it is our feeling that um, one of our goals is to have equal access for all children, and equal access will mean that all, all children will be offered full day programming. We wouldn't offer half day programming. Right. Naomi, you had your hand up earlier. I'm sorry. Uh, this is semantics in a way. I think that's a very good point, Mike about the uh, transitions. I think that what still goes in favor of the full day in that regard, building on top of the numbers, is that right now um, the children are, have a day that's chopped up into, the, there's no large segment. They're constantly on the move from one place to another. And so while the exact number of transitions may remain the same, they'll be settled in one place within one program for a little bit longer during, during the school day. And honestly, just having a flashback, I remember when my kids were young, I think and God bless all your uh, your teachers because there was quite a process that I don't want to think about it, but it's going to happen of getting the snow pants and the snow boots off and back on in time to get them on the bus. So that is that is killing your flow. And but yeah, I must do. But obviously that's you know when you think about those little things, you know that's 15 pairs of little snow pants and you know 30 feet, you know per classroom. It's it, it's not an easy job. So so they they deserve a ton of credit. So, and that can take a lot of time, so, but I remember. And then you get to go find them at the end of the year at that lost and found. So. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky, exactly. So, are there any other questions? Uh, Michael. Uh, definitely a valid point. I think that that's a different talking subject versus transition, so it might be a better way to actually present the data or, or content 
um, out there. Um, I did have a concern about the 20 minute blocks for art and music. I'm like, if you just to give the example of having to put snow snow boots on and jackets, trying to corral kids into a art class and get him going is going to take quite a while. And by the time the 20 minutes goes by, is it actually even a valid class at that point? So that might be some additional information I think might be interesting there. Thank you. I'll respond to that. We do have, that was just um, offered up as an example of schedules. We've gotten schedules from, we've received schedules from schools from all around New Hampshire. And that's what, one of the things we noticed. However, I, we feel that um, this is a place where the educators, the teachers themselves really need to weigh in. So we've asked them to look at pros and cons, but I appreciate that point. Thank you very much. Just one one additional point when you do come the next time, when um, when you have more information regarding any one of these, if you can actually provide statistical data, um, that would be helpful for someone like myself to actually see the numbers versus just a statement. So thank you. Cinda. Well, I really wanted to express my thanks for all of this work that you guys have all done. I know it's been a collective effort, you know, at the schools, and I'm really excited um, to get more and more information and data on this. Um, when I think of how much my own children had learned in kindergarten in two and a half hours, it's amazing. Their mind is open, you know, they learn to read, you know, for the most, I would say for the most part, and I'm I would sit there and think, how could the teachers do this in two and a half hours? And it's just got to be, and to go out for recess too, you know. So it's a lot to do in two and a half hours. So I'm I'm interested to hear more and more of what as we get into the budget season, and um, it it just seems like um, from everything that I've read, it it seems like it would be a more a natural learning to be able to spread it out for these kids to get some breaks to do um, more things besides the reading, the math, the writing, um, to create their total learning package. So I'm really excited about this. Um, I'm really excited about you all coming tonight. I really appreciate all the work that you've done, and I look forward to more information. So the only question I have written down, which uh, hasn't been addressed, is I look at the average graduating class ranging between 325 and 350 kids. So do we have what I would call max capacity scheduling in case, you know, we, we, we face this every year where enrollments, um, projected enrollments are a, a very well-educated guest, but they're not a scientific guarantee. So what I would say is in coming up with the number 240, this was done with NESDEC, um, who are, there is a demographer there who has done numbers for years and years. And so he dealt, um, with Miramac to look at the build out and what's gone on with um, multifamily dwellings and single dwellings, building permits, and so on. And so um, we we settled very much on uh, 240. The numbers too um, are cohorts are um, definitely dropping, so they're in the high 200s or whatever. We we just feel that this is a very good number. Okay. Um, I I've done due diligence and this year I think the principals would respond that even um, in the number that was projected this year it is pretty close to accurate for the first time I would say uh, we were almost spot on a few over but um, we, we were pretty close were we not yeah excellent and uh, I know we've had to have summer meetings as well so you know I, I think we as a board are, are tasked with being responsive um, if this is a new program and new programs can create new interest but uh just as as long as we keep in as a, we you know we as a board i think have to commit to being flexible as well to what to what we uh, inherit so and we have been to date and expect no different um on that note i think since the beginning of school when we looked at our enrollments we went up over 100 kids across the district so you know we are definitely a more desirable community every day so i would say to that point um, last year and this year, for the first time, I actually had phone calls from parents who are either in our community who have younger children, two and three years old, who are looking to find out, are you going to have full day kindergarten? And or, um, I've spent some time with the new 
um, executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, and I think it's also a question there. Are we uh, thinking about going forward? So it's just interesting to me that the public is asking us as compared to us kind of pushing it out there. I think, uh, I think there's an interest. To that end, I would just ask where um, we have members of the task force here presenting, are there any other queries that you would have beyond those things that will be raised up in the budget process that haven't been addressed? I mean, can you think um, of another aspect that, that wasn't covered? Because we literally went back to June 19th to look at exactly what each of you said that evening, but something else could have come out. And so when they come back in January, we want to make sure that we've responded accordingly. Okay, so send it to Michael. I mean, I would say some of those, you know, the other supporting factors that, um, you know, where we get economies of scale. So, like the busing, like Andy had mentioned, uh, food service, um, you know, some of the the um, the arts and music, um, that kind of thing. Just some of those other areas that um, would support the extra students, and and just to make sure that we don't have any surprises there that we're covered. Um, that's something I would suggest. And I would just add to that, just because it's a list, uh, before and after school care, which I know is contracted out, but where you might see a demand for that. Michael? Thanks. Uh, you, you bring up a concerning point to myself uh, that you talk about how we would actually become a more appealing um, community. So looking at the data, we would actually be um, pretty much the first town on Route 3 going north. I know Nashua has some, but not full full coverage of a kindergarten and still even close to one of the few that would be even near 93 because access to exit 12 kind of makes 93 a little bit more accessible. So what would that appeal be and how would that actually impact the school district in a future state? So if we're looking at what is our capacity to for the if the appeal was actually to increase here um, how would that actually impact the school district in years to come? And would we actually have to look at how that would be out throughout the school district? Andy? Well, my only comment is is that this map and even the, the more recent ones, there's a whole movement this year about full day kindergarten because of the Keno thing and other things like that. So I think one of the things that we need as part of that is the data of what the other districts around are doing because you're right if you look at this map the lower sex segment it looks like even bedford doesn't have it but i know all those communities i've heard on the news are looking looking at it so at the same time we are so it could be the dynamics for that popularity kindergarten may not be a driving factor if the everybody else is doing it so i guess it would be good for us to have just sort of a updated summary i mean if, when you do your diligence about the districts that have kindergarten if you could take the pulse of what surrounding districts that don't have it might be doing i mean we can do it ourselves as well but it'd be good just piece of data to have um you know as part of you know what's what's bedford doing what's londonderry doing what's uh you know the, the other districts and stuff like that michael so on the flip side if that's the case then maybe the appeal information actually wouldn't be relevant anymore in your in your presentation because if all those surrounding communities have it then the appeal wouldn't be as large so it wouldn't be a selling component to actually having kindergarten within the town either so I guess both sides either way it, it looks could be at a detractor if we don't if we don't have it if everyone else picks it up before we do that's okay there's the third one there so. you go. <laughs> marketing mind but well on that note I think is a as just kind of sum up the conversation I think as a board it's our job you know when we sign our our uh, our document every year, our code of, of ethics, you know, the first thing we do is we keep an eye on, on the quality of education that we put out. So that's that's where I would say all the data needs to, to me, come back to that, that first bullet is, you know, how is this going to impact future data? And you're doing that in all your presentations. So, you know, and you have done that tonight um, in spades. So that that's something we always have to be um, very cognizant of in, in how we make our decisions. You know, we do have to keep the taxpayer in mind, and we and we do in every decision we make. Um, I know that there's additional funding from the state that's available to us right now to to help to facilitate this. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we are doing what we can to put uh, the kids' best foot forward 
as they get into our system and having full day kindergarten has a lot of value to do that because our first grade program has a lot of orientation to it. I'm sure you probably notice every day because they're coming in from private kindergartens and they haven't learned the Merrimack way as they're coming into a first grade classroom. So and, and how we do business and how we our dynamics, our culture. So these are things that will help us to be more productive as we're really starting to get into the meat of things as well um, because we, we have that full day opportunity for them. Cinda? Well, I had one more thing as well, which would be um, the benefits for the students that are on IEPs and the benefits for the students in interacting. So I know like so there's a number of students that are in early intervention that go into kindergarten. It'd be nice, helpful to have um, just some information and some research on how the full day kindergarten supports that cohort as well. Mm -hmm. They're all writing feverishly. Andy. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we did this year was add the um, the after afternoon program for the morning kindergartners to help in those situations where IPs were in the um, the adult learning center added that so it'd be interesting to see how what we offer is the same covers the same area as what that after pro after school program did the afternoon program did I mean because I yeah, mm -hmm. cause to me it was a little bit of a mystery as to what it really did <laughs> um, so I guess by pulling that in and showing we as a district are now going to offer it and do these sorts of things that that adult learning center program used to do plus these additional that would just help to sort of round it out oh, good times yeah. can I ask Friday, a question yes. absolutely um, <laughs> certainly we're open to uh, any further insights the members of the board have about um, how we might help to provide more insight to the day to day above and beyond the data I know that Mrs. Jarlot has extended invitations to all board members to come and actually do site visits and actually be immersed in the kindergarten experience in any one of our schools so we'd like to extend that opportunity again um, sometimes kind of being in the bubble provides a very different perspective than um, just looking at the statistics and the and and the data and kind of having that qualitative and quantitative combination to make a determined more informed decision about programming so we just wanted to extend that invite to you all again and thank, thank you, you. <laughs> Excellent. are there any other questions on the kindergarten program seeing them thank you very much We're on to item number five, which is update on the Timmins property. And I will turn it over to Michael. Thank you very much. Um, so there was a discussion a few weeks ago, and unfortunately I wasn't able to be present. I'd like to thank Andy for bringing that forward and trying to uh, provide the discussion. So as you, you may know, um, as part of the Parks and Rec, we have looking at, um, should I wait until they? <laughs> Um, we've been looking at fields as a, a need for not only the school district, but also for the town as a greater whole. Um, and we looked at, started looking at the Timmins property with the approval of the school board to actually review that property to see if it might be feasible for fields. Um, we have reviewed the property uh, as a schematic of the property. We've looked at uh, the possibility of what size would be for within the property. Uh, sketched out the size of a field, overlaid it on the property, and came up with the opportunity to possibly put two fields, two full-size regulation fields on the property. Uh, we have then went and walked the property to kind of see where the slope started. We came to the same conclusion that there could be a possibility of two fields within that. So at this time, the Parks and Rec Committee um, would like to request that the school board approve the uh, to be surveyed at no cost to the school district um, the process would be that we would either reach out to the greater community to see if there's a surveyor available to survey the property for free because they might have a child that's playing sports um, or we may request the town since they have a surveyor if the resource is available so again we're just asking for the approval to actually survey the property with a true surveyor to get an assessment. Um, I know that many items came up and about soil samples and talking to the town about use and co-use and everything like that. We feel that we're not at that place yet because we need to actually understand whether you can even put fields in the, on the property yet. So we're just looking at kind of progressing the conversation along, trying to get it surveyed, 
making sure that the fields can fit. If it can't, the discussion is pretty much dead. But if it does, then we would actually try to start to formulate what are those next steps? Do we do a wetlands assessment, stuff like that? Um, do we work with the town fully and bring the school and the town together to actually discuss this property and see if it's something viable? So I just want to just emphasize that this is just a single step to actually figure out whether many of the items that actually came up in the last meeting would even be viable um, instead of actually trying to think too far ahead of the ahead of the uh, curve here. So that would be my, my request in the Parks and Rec's request. Naomi. Um, so just to clarify, because this is one of the things that came up last time, what you're talking about is a, a, when you say surveying is specifically for the physical size as opposed to any anything else to do with the land in question? Yeah, so we would actually get the true um, corners of the property to actually be able to look at the corners of the property so that we know exactly where they are, and then we would actually measure out where the fields might fit within that property. Are there any other questions from the board? I am not seeing any questions from the administration. No, oh, okay. Um, on that note, um, I assume you're about to make the motion. I'm just guessing. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to request that the school board approves that the Parks and Rec Committee, at no cost to the school district, gets the land surveyed. And at this point, no cost direct to the budget um, from the town to get the property surveyed. Does that make sense? For the most part. We can make it work in the minutes. <laughs> Is there a second? There's a second by Andy. Um, you want to speak to your motion? I think it's been spoken to quite a bit. Okay. Are there any <laughs> questions or comments to the motion? Andy. So when I tried to carry this water at the last meeting, obviously I, the conversation went in a bunch of different directions. and. And where I was going to try to make a similar sort of motion, but it derailed quite a bit. In my mind, if I think that just simply seeing if there can be a free, um, or if the town decides to cover to, to do a survey, and that's as far as it's going to go, is is acceptable to me. I mean, I would be in support of the motion. I know we talked a lot about the next steps and the what ifs and things like that, and I think that that's all valid stuff. I mean, nothing was invalid, but I think that it was, we shouldn't combine that with just the get the specs to make sure that what the boundaries are that we think are there. Where's the egress? Where's the right of way? I mean, there was discussions about is there access on uh, Dre Coach, you know, the other end of it? Do we have access or is it all not direct access? I mean, we, I think you need those answers, fundamental ones first. So, so it's, it's, it's interesting that this conversation was so brief compared to when I tried to do this, so, but anyway. I was trying to read Michael's mind through you and it wasn't translating, but that's yeah, all right. I, l I learned from that, but, yeah. um, uh, somebody, but just exactly to Annie's point, there's a lot of questions to be answered, mm -hmm. but I don't think that we need to actually ask them until we actually even know whether they're valid, so. Cinda? Uh, um, has Parks and Rec taken, has said anything to town council that, I mean, I just, something about it when it came up um, at the last meeting, or was it two meetings ago? I'm trying to remember. Last two. Meeting, okay. Two okay. Well, that's why, because we had an extra space. Um, something seemed a little um, off to me because it was, you, you know, we were kind of letting, you know, we would find someone to do it, but it was, so that's why I thought maybe it was a good topic for the town council school board meeting. Um, I mean, I, I would support it. Um, I, th I think I don't have a problem supporting it if there's no cost to us and everything else, but something seemed a little off to me. And so that's what I was trying to grapple with. It's a valid question. Um, within the Parks and Rec, the Parks and Rec has set up a subcommittee to actually cr try to figure out if there's properties within town that actually could be um, suitable for um, any fields that are needed within the town. So we're moving forward to actually try to figure out where those locations would be. We haven't brought it full forward within w to the town council. I believe Matt has made them aware that we're looking at the property. But again, it's we're trying to, I like the approach of actually knowing if there's a discussion to be had at this point, since the Parks and Rec Committee is a subcommittee of, for a part of the town, and they have asked for this to be actually requested to the school to be able to, school district to be able to do it. 
Anything else from anyone else? I, I would have to say that, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to the motion at all, but I definitely think that we have an opportunity. Um, we don't meet that often. So I would like to discuss, you know, what the, the, the council's understanding is. We are going to have fields needs as a part of our, um, our meeting next week. And just, you know, what their thoughts are on the on the Timmins property and Parks and Rec's role in it. So I think that's going to be a very important part of our discussion next week. So that way, you know, as we're, we're entering into this, we haven't made any overtures of availability or any overtures of, of, of how it would be managed, who would oversee it, um, even who would own the property. So all those things, I think, based on our historical um, collaboration and, and, and where we are now with it, is it's is worthy of discussion next week. Um, does it mean that we shouldn't uh, allow the survey? Not at all. But, you know, what do they expect once the survey is done? And what are their hopes from us when the survey is done from a council perspective? Because it's not going to be Parks and Rec owning it. Parks and Rec doesn't own anything. The town does. We do. The governing bodies, um, the town council, the, the school board oversees those as, as um, the governing bodies. So making sure that we know it's kind of like, you know, that, that from the top that they're supportive of this. I think it's, it'd be a good thing. So no, I'm not. I'm not opposed to this motion at all. But I also want to make sure that they're looped in and, and we have an understanding of, of their their expectations of, of what we're going to do um, if it comes back viable or not viable, and and who's gonna who's gonna be responsible <laughs> to make it so. So valid questions, but I would say that it's premature to actually ask to speak regarding a single property because the subcommittee within Parks and Rec is trying to see if there's viable properties. It, it, and mm -hmm. again, the town council has not been like, hey, what do you think about the Timmins property at this point? So they might come back and say, you know what, Parks and Rec is discussing it, and that's where I think that there would be. Um, I would like to see that we actually have a greater discussion just on the challenges of fields and properties with a whole mm -hmm. versus trying to focus on this Timmins property because it's not been presented to the town council. I, I've referenced that it's been in a subcommittee within the Parks and Rec. We're trying, Parks and Rec has taken an approach to obviously try to, you know, focus on properties that are available. Um, Peter is well aware of the discussions that have been going on, so I'm not sure if Peter has, but if we go in there trying to talk about the Timmins property, I think what will happen is just what happened in the last time that this came up, and it's gonna get derailed pretty quickly because there hasn't been any it, it, we're not even at that point yet to actually have that discussion. So uh, just my advisement to the, the board that I think that we should focus on the larger issue of town. Uh, and and we will. Right. But I just think the, the, the challenge is that on average we meet once a year. So we, we don't want to wait a year to come up with what the plan will be. And if there's anything we have to do legally, having to wait a year to get that executed. So I think we want to touch it. I don't think we have to decide anything. But I do think that we want to address the efforts that were that are being made through Parks and Rec and, um, and our understanding of your goals with it, um, if they are workable, um, you know what would what would they like to see? What would we like to see? So I think you know I don't, I don't want there to be any assumptions, so that way we don't you know have to wait a year for another joint meeting on on a couple of fields. Cinda. Well, and I think even here's a heads up. This is what we've allowed to happen, you yes, know, as absolutely. a result of the subcommittee, you know, blah blah blah. And that's maybe all we need to say about that. Right. But it, you know, it's in what Mike said. It's part of a broader issue where we the shortage of fields that we have in the community and so on and so forth. Yeah. But um, I intend to support his motion. Oh, absolutely. So, are there any other questions or comments on the motion? Seeing them, we'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed none. The motion carries five zero zero. Thank you, everyone. On to item number six, which is board meeting dates in January and change in location. Marge. Thank you. So if you <clears throat> look in your um, packet, you'll see that I wanted to highlight that in the month of January, both of your normal meeting dates, um, which are the first and third Mondays, we need to make an adjustment because one is New Year's Day and the other is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So therefore, in the month of January, we'd be meeting on the first Tuesday and the third Tuesday, which would be January 2nd and January 16th. Both of those dates um, are encumbered as far as the location here. I believe it's the planning board that meets on those nights in the Matthew Thornton room. 
So I would just tell you that for January 2nd, we are slated to be in the Memorial Room um, at Town Hall, which is located close to the town manager's office. Um, I will tell you that uh, we've already worked with the media department. We won't be broadcast live, but um, they, they certainly will film us and it will go up uh, shortly thereafter. For the 16th, that's still um, tentative because there is another group um, in the memorial room at that time. We're looking at that, and we also have availability in the all-purpose room at Mastercola Elementary School. It will be one or the other, but that's still in flux at the moment. So I think the more important thing is to just get our dates ordered up so we can publicize those and to know that the first one is going to be in the memorial room. Andy? So what you don't have on here is usually what complicates January, and that's budget meetings. Um, so I think that while these are documented dates that I personally don't have a problem with for school board meetings, this is just the tip of the iceberg of other oddball days during that first part mm -hmm. of January mm -hmm. that we're going to run up against. And, and my other comment, I guess, is why are we not considering the high school cafeteria? It should be quieter now. Um, right. I, I think, um, quite frankly, it is difficult um, for the media division. I mean, they, they oh, do it for the budget committee. Over, yeah. But I think we have to be considerate of them. And okay. so if we can bring it closer here, um, that's just advantageous for all. So we're it, trying to make the best arrangement know, possible. Just, my only comment is, is that the month of January is insane with the media department anyway. And maybe there's a way we maybe we they can be proactive to maybe keep some equipment on site so it's easier to move and things like that because there's going to be you're right budget committee meetings that happen that month school but school board other meetings and stuff like that so for me i don't care where the location really is i think it's to, to work with them on what's most convenient and is there a room or a methodology they set up that they can reuse multiple times during that month period because january is just going to be meetings end to end so cinda so I think the memorial room is the one where like Parks and Rec meets in, right? So it already has the, it's already set up to do the recording yeah, and the everything. mics and the and the stationary cameras. Yeah, so that would be an advantage, right? To yes. Doing it there with less wear and tear for the, okay. So so far those dates work for everyone, and we'll plan to go forward. On to item number seven, which is a guaranteed maximum rate for health insurance with Matt Chevenel. Well, as you know, around this time of year, we have the guaranteed maximum rate that's given to us by the health trust. It's what we use for our budgeting purposes. And in April, sometime we get the actual rate. Well, the guaranteed maximum rate this year for health insurance is an increase of 3.5% which we will incorporate it in the budget, see where the different people fall in, and uh, see how that projects into an increase. But it's 3.5%. Really? There's not like a 1 in front of that 3? No. or There no, was last year. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're shocking us, Matt. This is I know. the lowest I can ever remember. So, and honestly, kudos goes to the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee, the Wellness Committee, um, things like Smart Shopper for your uh, procedures and your testing, um, all those save, uh, they save the district money and the programs are advantageous and structured in the way to do so. And these committees communicate those opportunities to staff throughout the district throughout the year. So I really think that that has a lot to do with um, with with how we are, are trying to stabilize our rate. So last year it was about 13.5% and that was the guaranteed maximum rate so just to define that that's the worst case scenario so this year the worst case scenario is that health insurance will go up 3.5 percent it didn't go up the maximum this past year so and it can still be under 3.5 percent but it cannot be more and I think that's a very important thing for for us to uh to really to really uh celebrate uh considering what we had last year we're down to less than a quarter of what we had so good job So, on that note, are there any questions on GMR? Seeing that, yeah, we would like to lock that in for the next decade and and still not make that number, that'd be great. 
Um, so we're on to item number eight, which is the approval of the October 16th, 2017 minutes. So I have a motion to accept, made by Cinda, second, seconded by Andy. Any, ed any edits to the minutes? I am seeing none. We'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. Abstain, one. Abstaining uh, Mike Thompson as he was absent. And so the motion carries 401. On to item number nine, which is the consent agenda with Mark. Two items tonight on consent. The first is approval of food procurement procedures and code of conduct. And the second is approval of data records retention policy. Do I have a motion? Andy? I move we accept the uh, consent agenda with those two policies and uh, procedure documents that we reviewed in previous weeks. Do we have a second? Seconded by Naomi. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. Abstain. And Mike Thompson abstains. We're on to item number 10, which is other. So A is correspondence. Is there any correspondence to come before the board? I had one. There was a parent very interested in um, what was going on with full day kindergarten, and she has since been added to the committee. So, um, you know, we thank her for uh, taking the time. And Andy and I think Michael. Yeah, I had uh, contact from a, from a resident asking for more information about our participation in some of the vocational programs in different districts. So I sent him to administration for more information. Excellent. And Michael? Uh, I had two uh, individuals reach out. One was in regards to the homework policy still. I requested that they actually, because this was actually pertaining to an individual class, I asked them to reach out to the teacher to actually discuss that further to better understand how uh, the grading was broken down. And then I had another one reach out uh, due to the, um, I don't want to call it an evacuation, but the shifting of students from one school to the other when we had that a few weeks ago um, and asking regarding the policy, regarding that a little bit for further details. I also, again, asked them to reach out to the principal for further discussion on that. Andy forgot one. And I also had a phone conversation with a resident about the homework policy as well, a, a long conversation. So. Policy or protocol? The policy. Both. Okay, that's fine. So, so policy hasn't changed, protocol has. So I just want to make sure. I do try. So, um, is there any more correspondence that we just remembered to come before the board? Okay, just checking. <laughs> Seeing none, um, on to comments. Are there any comments from the board? March. So um, the only one thing I wanted to raise up because tonight there was such a major focus on kindergarten is the fact that you know that I'm working with all administrators across the district um, is that is one of our number one goal. I would put it the number one goal because the implementation of math is a close second. And so I am putting um, the original equipping, the furniture, working on the staffing, working on offsets to the staffing, I'm putting those elements in the budget. And so I say that to you because we hadn't talked openly about whether you would want it to be a warrant or whether you would want it to be in the budget. So just for your knowledge, I'm putting it in the budget with the idea we will know exactly where the cost lies. If you decide to pull it out, um, so be it. But it's easier for us to work where the items are already built um, to put it as a part of the budget. But I wanted to say that openly to you, and if you wanted to push back on me, you'd push back now. You always have that choice to do it, but just for planning purposes, that's how I'm going about business. Cinda? I would say that sounds fine, and I think that that gives us kind of the big pie, you know, really what we're looking at from total cost, and however, you know, we decide to pull that out or whatever is just something we can do in the process, so. I appreciate the heads up. Okay. Um, I had a couple comments. Uh, one, we alluded to it earlier this evening. There will be a joint meeting of the school board and the town council a week from tomorrow. That's November 14th in this room at 7 p.m. Items um, that we put up for discussion in our previous meetings, the one that was pulled off the agenda um, per the town council's request was full day kindergarten. 
So um, based on the fact that it's more of an education initiative than a town council purview, they didn't um, they didn't feel it was necessary, but we'll continue to discuss it and be the conduit for communication. But um, we will go from there. So uh, we have Fields Needs, we have O'Gara Drive, we have, um, we have so much. Um, the water uh, districts so of the MVD was invited to come first because they are a guest. Um, so there's there's quite a bit, and the agenda will be posted um, probably as early as, as tomorrow. So, and then um, tonight uh, we originally oh sorry, go ahead, okay tonight we originally had scheduled on the agenda the feedback for on the homework protocol per the parents' request at our last meeting, and um, after uh, notifying that parent, Mr. Bevel, who came to us a couple of weeks ago at our meeting, um, he is traveling and was unable to make tonight's meeting. So he asked if we could postpone it, and so we'll put it on the meeting agenda of the 20th. Uh, but it was our intent to do it tonight and uh, be ahead of it, right on top of it. So, And now over to you, March. Thank you. I just thought of another thing. So tomorrow night um, we go before the planning board with our capital improvement plan, and we're also going to have um, Paul Marinese, um, the um, architect, um, going before the planning board, too, because you can remember that the planning board who was here with you at some point in time, raised up the notion that when we look at a consolidation of the special services building in our office, that perhaps we could do um, an addition on to the high school. Do you remember he went through options with you when we were at Master Call Elementary School? The same presentation that he did for you is going to be done for the planning board um, so that they can clearly see that um, that was taken very seriously, um, and you looked at it. And so they will get the same information, and that will be tomorrow night. Um, so on that note, uh, if there are no other comments, we will go on to number 11, which is new business. Any new business to come before the board? You're just on a roll, Marge. Back at you. Um, my only um, note here is to say that you like to know what's coming forward. So. Um, Shannon has already told you that the homework protocol will be um, addressed. In addition, John Fabrizio will be here with the Merrimack School District Special Education Manual. You remember that the policy you approved tonight having to do with data and records retention will be a part of that manual. He'll be here to present that to you. And also the physical education health curriculum um, update will be done for you as well. Excellent. And then one clarifier, since we talked about the homework protocol agenda item, it is an agenda item that is specifically for parents to give feedback to the board. So just like we have public comments, we'll do the same thing, um, but we'll specifically just carve out some time about the homework protocol so that we can focus um, our attention. It's definitely not where there's going to be the dialogue, but we just want to hear what parents have to say at this point. And then in January, we are still going to put it on our agenda for the end of the first semester. Um, review on, on how that homework protocol is impacting um, student outcomes. So, um, and on that, um, we will close new business. Go on to item number 12, which is committee reports. Are there committee reports from the board? Cinda? I have and two. Naomi. <laughs> okay. uh, one was the first communications committee of the year. Um, basically, what we did at that committee was um, that meeting was a recap of last year. Uh, talked a little bit about how we might group, you know, going forward and so forth. But one thing I did want to note out of that meeting, um, there's been like a quite an overhaul of the website. Um, there are certain areas that uh, people can subscribe to information that's posted. So um, I'm testing it out myself. Just like, for example, there is a community link where you can subscribe to some of the budget-related uh, Detail. So the way that works is something's posted that you would get kind of that, um, you're like a tickler, you would get an alert um, to let you know um, to go look there. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, a lot of the information and feedback from the committee and from parents through surveys um, was incorporated with some of the things that's being done. I don't know, Mark, is there anything else that I miss? That was a good summary of our first meeting. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Mark was also at Safeguard, um, the Safeguard meeting. Um, I think right now the committee is really looking at um, what is its role going forward. Um, 
basically, you know, there was discussion about um, the upcoming meeting um, to discuss the resource officer at the middle school and uh, some of the, the joint functions and the community collaboration that we um, might need going forward. Um, the other thing we talked about was Red Ribbon Week. Uh, there was an activity at the middle school as part of that week. Really incredible. Um, it looks like not only did it have a huge impact, but also it looks like people had a lot of fun. Uh, the classrooms decorated their doors and lots of things to support. So that's something that I saw a number of pictures of some of the doors. So maybe we can store that for when the middle school comes at the end of the year and do their year in recap. It was, I think, really neat to see, you know, what some of the stuff that came up with. But uh, lots of talk about um, awareness around substance abuse and commitments from kids to not um, get involved in substance abuse. So it sounded like a really great event. Um, there was also the take back that recently happened. Apparently, these are kind of um, interesting facts, uh, at least for me, when we look at how much was actually taken back in Merrimack, it looks like there was 322.3 pounds taken back. Recently, there was already 100 pounds of approximately, um, I believe that we had already stored, but altogether it came out to 322.3 pounds. So when you think of like the magnitude of that with these little tiny collection of medication and pills and how light they really are, it's pretty powerful. They also gave us a statewide figure, which was 13,160 pounds. Uh, for take back, so um, that was interesting. Um, and then I, you know, we also talked about kind of really, uh, you know, a new direction. Do we go into subcommittees and and break out and work out on things? And what is our role? And what are the things we recapped a little bit of some of the things that Safeguard had been involved in in the past, and that um, have kind of gone into found another place where you know things are going on. Um, ongoing without necessarily safeguards involvement anymore. Um, but that's pretty much um, what I have for that. Anything else there, Mark? Thank you. Summarize that perfectly again. All right. Thank you. That's all I have. Naomi. Um, I have been invited to serve as the um, board representative on the full day kindergarten task force, as was mentioned earlier today. Um, we've met once. The presentation represented pretty much everything that was talked about except one rather fun fact and that is um, going around the table there I believe that we were topping three decades worth of kindergarten teaching experience at the table so it was rather wonderful and, and, and a substantial amount of parental um, experience as well so I think the group is going to do a, an excellent job. Michael? Uh, I attended the professional development meeting um, and we discussed uh, changes in allocation of money when they actually signed up for that. But really what I wanted to just uh, kind of point out is the amazing amount of time that the teachers spend beyond the workday actually educating themselves throughout the school year. I think that they, uh, the Merrimack um, teachers and staff and everyone do a wonderful job of continuing their education to become a better um, provider of education to the children of this community. So. Andy. So I think I mentioned this last time. This when I went to the, I missed the healthcare, um, or the wellness committee. One of the things I mentioned is that there was going to be a presentation on Lyme disease awareness, um, just to confirm that um, on Tuesday, November fourteenth, so a week from tomorrow at six thirty at the high school little theater, uh, there will be a viewing of the movie called Under Our Skin, followed by a question and answer session with a couple of experts in the field uh, um, around the tick uh, Lyme disease. So. Um, just a, a reminder that that's happening a week from tomorrow at the high school little theater at 6.30. Yes, that's something I avoid, I would avoid getting if I had to do it again. <laughs> so um, I attended the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee uh, on the 1st, and uh, we went over strategies. There's a wellness fair for staff, um, for public employees, obviously, through our health trust partner. That's scheduled for January 18th at the high school. So. It really is an important part for them to maximize their uh, their benefit coverage, um, get them a biometric screening, um, just really get their hands around um, what's available to them to keep our guaranteed maximum rate at the lowest possible rate because we're doing everything we can to stay well. Um, and then, of course, every month they have um, 
you know, a feature of the benefits um, that we, we try to focus in on. And the Live Health Online feature was, was shared with staff. And it's basically where you would um, be online live with a doctor. And Lyme disease is one of the things that came up. There was a tick bite that was, um, that was reviewed live online. And uh, they can uh, prescribe over, over the web and, and uh, they did not have to wait to see a doctor to address the tick bite. So it's a, it's a benefit that's also um, going into, they have mental health benefits as well that can, that can be uh, assessed through that program. So they're doing a lot more to make sure our staff has um, access to their benefits and stay on top of their wellness. And uh, there's also the uh, the November Nutrition le Newsletter. So they're doing a lot to uh, st uh, share with our staff uh, ways to stay healthier and um, tips on that. And throughout there, they always have great tips. Um, salad dressing was a very sobering one for me. So um, definitely making your own is a lot better for you. But um, you know, there's definitely, you know, in this month it was, um, it was legumes, it was how to cook lentils. So incorporating lentils and doing uh, one meat-free day a, a week just for, for wellness. So, um, you know, it was meat-free Mondays, I believe it's what it's called. So doing more to just give those tips for, for everyday life to, uh, to our staff. So very hardworking group and our health trust partners, you know, always bring new, in, new information to the table to, to keep us on top of things. I don't think I missed anything, did I, Marge? Okay, excellent. Um, so that is it for committee reports. Um, on to item number 13, which is public comments on agenda items. Does anyone would like to speak on the agenda items presented tonight? Just come to the microphone, state your name and address for the record. If you use these microphones, just press the button so the green light illuminates. Oh, I, I'll just, just press it and let it go and it should be better. Like that. Okay. You better. Thank um, you. Thank you. My name is Julie Tomshock. Um, I'm I basically wanted to come in to talk about the PFOA, and since that was something you guys were discussing, granted my situation is not so much on the filtration. Um, and mine does have to do with the school district and my concerns. Um, basically, I lived on 24 Profile Drive. I moved to Merrimack in 2000. Um, my health deteriorated in 2005. Um, my thyroid had shut down. Some of you look very familiar, like I had seen you guys on the field with my kids. So, um, anyway, I was very involved in the community. I used to volunteer at the YMCA. Um, I was in the Milford's Moms Group. Very, very involved in the community. And it's been very disheartening, some of the things that's happened to me since my health deteriorated. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Um, Basically, I wanted to find out what the school has in place since there's such an outburst of this situation with the PFOA because I think that's why my health deteriorated. We lived not far from the dump and not that far from St. Globin. My ex-husband also worked in the semiconductor industry. So those are the three possible contaminants that I could have gotten from. I moved away in 2009, almost 2010, and it took a while, and of course, you know, the half-life or whatever of the contaminant to get out of your system eventually, you know, was better. But um, the side effects that I've had to deal with, just the social aspect within the community has definitely deteriorated, and my ex-husband certainly hasn't contributed to it. Basically, I went through a nasty divorce in 2008. It finalized in 2010. Um, but basically, I had two situations where I had thyroid issues in 2005 and 2007. It was very public. It was on the local news. Basically, I was the first ever Amber Alert in the state of New Hampshire. That's how serious it was. And uh, basically, my thyroid had shut down. I was on the verge of dying. Um, and they didn't know it. They did not know. It wasn't for 24 hours later that they knew my thyroid had shut down. Anyway, eventually once I started on the thyroid meds, I got better, but, you know, basically, it, again, in 2007, I was probably taking too much thyroid medication and ended up back in the hospital yet again. Yet, um, because of the timing of when I had my daughter, they thought I had postpartum depression, which of course my ex-husband used that to gain custody of my children. 
I have been dealing with a nasty custody battle, which has been aggravated uh, by the Merrimack School District. And I have done my best to deal with different administrators. Some have been better than others. And um, I've dealt with situations in the Reed Ferry School District in particular where I was shuttled off to a little dark room, was not allowed to see where my children sat. And that went on for years and years. And it wasn't addressed until I finally got a hold of the assistant vice principal and then it was changed. But by then, so many years of my children's life were gone. Um, samples of children's artwork, handwriting, none of that was provided. Photographs of my kids, nothing. My ex-husband basically would interfere in any of the phone calls from my children. Basically, if I called, he would, sh and I said, hey, how's school going? He would scream, inappropriate. So I couldn't even find out how my children's day at school was. It got to the point that my children were lying about the weather. The only way I could find out how my children were doing was report cards or power school. Um, I had also moved out of the area. Um, and so some schools were very good as far as giving information. But I want to know specifically what the schools are implementing as far as someone who has potentially suffered a PFOA contamination and how they're addressing any potential situations. It's not just children that have been affected, that there are probably parents that are basically been separated from their children and labeled a certain way. And how is the school going to handle that situation? Because I have been totally humiliated by the Merrimack School District. I was offered a job and then it was taken away, yet I can work in Nashua at their school district, Manchester at their school district, but not Merrimack. So I would like to know what you guys plan on doing in the future to rectify potential situations like this. Sorry about that, I'm doing my own thing about the light. Um, I will say that um, the public comment section of our board, which is in our instructions, is not designed to do a response. Um, I would like to speak to you off camera okay. um, and offline um, because this is definitely where we worry about you know student um, privacy rights. Mm -hmm. So it would be our intention to work with you offline to um, address the concerns that you have for your family and we'd be glad to do that. Um, but we just want to make sure that you, you understand that we don't respond on That's camera fine. to this. That's fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Brian Stisser of 56 Middlesex Road. Uh, and I was wanting to offer some further comment on the all day kindergarten issue uh, since it hasn't been quite beaten enough tonight. Uh, while I am a parent of a uh, three year old who I do hope to have enter the Merrimack School District in the coming years, that is not my primary interest in this issue. My primary interest really comes from being a homeowner and taxpayer in Merrimack and a, a voter in Merrimack. Um, because of the fact that, as was mentioned, the overwhelming majority of school districts in New Hampshire and in the country already have full day kindergarten. Uh, Nashua has already moved to have full day kindergarten starting next year. Several other surrounding towns are making that decision. Uh, so as a taxpayer in Merrimack, I have concerns if we do not make that move as uh, as Andy alluded to what is that going to do to the brand of Merrimack if you will uh, when my wife and I to offer some anecdotal evidence to uh, what the economic development impact would be my wife and I chose to purchase a home in Merrimack two years ago uh, one of the largest compelling factors in choosing Merrimack over Nashua or uh, any of the other surrounding towns was the excellent reputation of Merrimack schools. Um, so at this time, as a parent who did buy a home recently in Merrimack, our family would not have made the choice to move to Merrimack uh, with the current discussions around full day kindergarten without that being something that the town is offering. Uh, and so if we don't go that direction, then I do fear we are going to turn off many other families who we do want to attract, and that is going to have uh, potentially serious economic repercussions for the entire town. Thank you. 
Thank you. If there are no other public comments on the agenda items, we will close public comments. We will take a moment to sign the manifest, and I will entertain a motion to go into non-public session per RSA 91-A colon 3, uh, Roman numeral 2, sections A, B, C, and D. Made by Michael, seconded by Andy. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Michael. In favor. Cinda. In favor. Andy. In favor. And I vote in fa favor. The motion carries 5-0. Thank you, and good night.